as I said, the ninth chapter is just a slice of Christian life. I just, it's just amazing what's going on here. In this situation, we see that God has caused all things to work together for good for those who loved him and were called according to his purpose. At different points in chapter nine, we see things looking so bad and then we see things looking so good. Saul is on a rampage. And the next thing you know, he's miraculously converted. And uh, Peter has been confined basically to Jerusalem because they have been uh, persecuting Christians so. And yet with Saul's conversion, all of a sudden now he can move about freely. And he winds up ministering close to Joppa, so close that they can call on him to come whenever Dorcas or Pat Tabitha passes away. God takes all these different threads of life and weaves them all into a beautiful tapestry, doesn't he? Beautiful, glorious cloth where good things happen and multitudes wind up being brought into his kingdom. Now, Joppa, I just noticed earlier, well, it was last night, it dawned on me. Joppa is a pre pretty significant place. It's the port city for Jerusalem, really. It's now a suburb of uh, Tel Aviv. But whenever uh, ships brought goods in to, for, to head to Jerusalem, this is the port they would come to. This is where the cedars of Lebanon were brought to build the temple. And this is where years before Jonah, when he was running from God, trying to get away from God, knowing what God wanted him to do and not wanting to do it at all. This is where he went to hop on a ship to try to run from God. And one of the stories or one of the lessons I think we can learn just from that is that it's not the place that makes the difference. It's the people and their relationship with the Lord. You can have people running from God and you can have people who are hungering and thirsting to please God in the same place, in the same town. I know so many people that just think if I could just be in the right place, then I could be of service. And uh, the thing is, you're in the right place wherever you are. And so that's one of the messages I think that we can get from there. Now, uh, there are three major characters in the ninth chapter of the book of Acts. There is Saul or Paul, and then there's Peter. And both of these men were tremendous leaders, and we know all about them. And then there's a third main character, a lady who was named Tabitha. And then it says, which is translated Dorcas. And uh, I don't know why, but everybody wants to call her Dorcas. I mean, that's, that's her Greek name. And it could be, it was like uh, a lot of other names back there. Uh, like John Mark, they call it by both their Greek name and their Hebrew name. It could be that. But Tabitha means gazelle. And the gazelle was uh, the creature that was just looked on as epitomizing beauty. It was graceful and had beautiful eyes. In fact, they've now named one gazelle the Dorcas gazelle. Why they didn't name it the Tabitha gazelle, I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> but she was named Tabitha. So the thing is, you wonder how she got that name. And I imagine many of you uh, have looked on your children as you were given them a name. And back then, Names had a significance. Back then, a name told you something about that person or some sort of hope they had for that person, if nothing else. 
And some names wound up being just like bumper stickers today. Some names like the prophet's names, many of them were messages like my name, Joel, Joel. It's a Hebrew name, which uh, the Joe part is for Jehovah. The L part is Elohim. My name means the Lord is God. So my name's like a bumper sticker for my whole life because the Lord is my God. And uh, well, let's see, Clara. There's a, we have a Clara in here. Clara in Latin means bright uh, and, uh, and clear. And uh, so uh, anyway, I could go through and give you your different name meanings, but we're not going to, that's not what this is all about. But the thing is, I would imagine, I was just thinking about this. Why did they, I know they didn't name her Dorcas. You know, they named her Tabitha. They named her Gazelle. And I imagine that that little baby had the most beautiful eyes you could imagine. And that's probably why they named her Tabitha. But it turns out that she wound up being a beautiful and graceful person, if not physically in her soul, because we see that she was just filled with good works and kindness, kindness and goodness, obviously just oozed from this woman so much. Some people just, just, just leak Jesus, you know? And apparently, Tabitha was like one of those. And so uh, she was a just a beautiful person. And she got sick and she died. And people grieved and were missing her terribly just at her point of death. And you know, if the story ended there, that would be enough, really, because she had lived a good life. She had done good things. But the story doesn't stop there because God had something else in mind for Tabitha and for Peter and for all the people in that whole region. Now, one thing that these three particular people have in common, Saul, Peter, and Tabitha, is that they all did the best they could for the Lord. They pretty well epitomized Colossians 3.23, where it says, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. And I love it that Tabitha is given equal weight with these two famous guys, because it reminds us that there are no small ministries in the kingdom of God. And there are no insignificant saints. And I know that sometimes moms can feel insignificant, especially if you've chosen to be a stay-at-home mom. You can feel like you're just, you've been set aside by God. This reminds us that if you're doing what you're doing as unto the Lord, it has meaning. It has significance, and you have significance in this world. Everyone plays a significant part. I want us to draw three life lessons from Tabitha's story today. The first one is use your gifts, whatever they might be. Uh, John Newton said, self likes to do great things, but grace teaches us to do little things with a great spirit for the Lord's sake. That's what Tabitha did, and that's what all of us should do. Not just the big things. Some people just wait their whole life for the big thing, and they miss their life, and they miss the fact that the little things could have built up and brought something else about if they'd been willing to take the steps of doing the little things for the Lord. Wherever you are, whoever you are, God's given you gifts and he's given you graces to be used where you are.
So whatever they are, I encourage you to use them. If you put a light under a bushel, take the bushel off and start using that gift. Don't wait for the opportunity. Opportunity is there if you prayerfully open your eyes. Start doing what you can, where you are, with what you have. Uh, There's a story that I ran across yesterday about Stonewall Jackson's army. They once, he found his army stuck on one side of a river when it needed to be on the other side of the river. And after telling his engineers to plan and build a bridge so that the army could cross, he called his wagon master you know, and he told him that it was urgent that the wagon train cross the river as soon as possible. So the wagon master started gathering all the logs, rocks, and fence rails he could find, and he built a bridge. And long before daylight, General Jackson was told by his wagon master that all the wagons and artillery had crossed the river. And General Jackson asked, where are the engineers and what are they doing? And the wagon master said, they're in their tent drawing up plans for a bridge. Now, in the Christian life, sometimes you need to just start doing it. You can sit around planning, dreaming, hoping, trying to second guess God and miss what needs to be done. Whatever he's told you to do at the moment, do that. Don't put off doing what you know he wants you to do now, waiting for something else. Sowing was Tabitha's gift. Uh, I doubt if she ever spoke at a missionary meeting or taught a women's Bible class. I don't think she ever had much of an opportunity because she was one of the early saints. But she did a lot of wonderful things for people. Now, you'll notice that the widows, that it was widows that conducted this fashion show for Peter, showing him all the tunics and clothing that uh, he had made. They were showing off the garments, the garments that uh, Tabitha had made. Now, why did the widows do it? Because they were poor, because they wouldn't have had any clothes if it hadn't been for Tabitha. She'd sewn those clothes for them. And this was her ministry. Sewing, if you will, was her spiritual gift. Some people wouldn't think of sowing as a spiritual gift, but whatever talent God has given you, it's a gift to be used to make a difference in the world around you and for his glory. And the two go together. Tabitha made an enormous impact on her community by always doing kind things for others and helping the poor by making coats and other garments And when she died, the room was filled with people who were going to miss her terribly. God uses great preachers like Peter and Paul, but he also uses those who have gifts of kindness like Tabitha. And rather than wishing you had other gifts, make good use of the gifts that God has given you. That's the first thing I want us to take away today. The second one, when you find yourself in an impossible situation in life, remember who's in charge. I don't, being a preacher, I've had the opportunity to be in some really strange places in life. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go through them now, but sometimes my church members can drag me into some of the craziest things that you could ever imagine. And you get in, the, you, you, you just go because you're supposed to, but you don't know what in the world you can do. You just go. And then when you show up, as you prayerfully show up, the Lord will organize and cause the right thing to happen. Here, Peter, he's there ministering. And these disciples come from Joppa and they want him to come back with them because somebody's died. And so he goes. But what's he going to do when he gets there? You know, it's not like 
he had ever done anything like this before. And maybe, we don't know for sure, it could have been that they sent for Peter before Tabitha died. We don't know that for sure. But it appears that she was already dead whenever they sent for her. And so what would you do if somebody called you all distraught and wanted you to come because somebody died? You would at least want to go and comfort the people. But the thing is, and this is one of the things that Peter saw, don't make your own conclusion as to what you should do. Whenever, just because you're asked to do something, pray about it before you do it. You see, Peter went because he was called and he went in the name of Jesus. He went and here's this lady who doesn't have life and he sends everybody out of the room and then he prays. He prayed about what to do and the Lord gave him direction. Now, at the same time, he did have examples, didn't he? He probably, as he was praying, the Lord brought to mind that time when a little girl was dead, when Jairus' daughter was dead, and Jesus was called, and she passed away before he got there. And he wound up saying, Talitha kum, child, arise. And the little girl arose. And so the Lord may have brought that to mind, or the Lord may have just said, do this. Whatever the reason, after he had prayed, then he turned around and he spoke to Tabitha. And Tabitha opened her eyes. And all of a sudden, the whole world was different because Tabitha was alive once more. Many times we can find ourselves in great dilemmas in life. Dilemmas where we don't really have any control, where really what's in front of us is is something that we're powerless to really handle ourselves. Some people would call it a dilemma. Uh, I ran across a story about a couple of hunters that wound up in a dilemma. They were uh, out hunting and this big bear came charging at them and so they dropped their rifles and they ran for cover. One man climbed a tree while the other hid in a nearby cave. And the bear wasn't in really a big hurry to eat and so he sat down between the tree and the cave to reflect on his good fortune because he had two good meals there waiting for him now. And suddenly for no apparent reason The hunter in the cave came rushing out, almost ran into the waiting bear, hesitated, and then dashed back into the cave again. And the same thing happened a second time. And when he ran out of the cave for the third time, his companion, the tree, frantically called out, Woody, are you crazy? Stay in the cave till the bear leaves. Can't, panted Woody. There's another bear in the cave. Sometimes you wind up in spots where they just seem impossible. I've been there and you've been there. And yet here we stand today because the Lord got us through in some shape, form or fashion. So all I can do, I just want to tell you, when you find yourself in an impossible situation in life, remember who's in charge. Pray and then obey. I have a a friend who is a world-renowned evangelist that uh, she finally got to the place where she prayed a lot. A lot of people were healed under her ministry. But she discovered that the Lord has different things for different people. And she got to the place where before she would pray for someone, she would pray to the Lord, Lord, how would you have me pray for this person? And I think that's wise. I think that's wise. Well, last thing I want us to learn from all this, some things are even more important than life. And this is, this came out, it comes from a comment that John Wesley made about this particular happening. These are John Wesley's words, actually. Peter, having put them all out, that he might have of the better opportunity of wrestling with God in prayer, said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes 
and seeing Peter set up. Who can imagine the surprise of Dorcas when he, and he calls her Dorcas, when he called her back to life or her friends when they saw her alive for the sake of themselves and of the poor, there was cause of rejoicing and much more for such a confirmation of the gospel. Yet, and this is a big yet, listen to this, yet to herself, it was a matter of resignation, not joy to be called back to these scenes of vanity. But doubtless her remaining days were still more zealously spent in the service of her Savior and her God. Thus was a richer treasure laid up for her in heaven, and she afterward returned to a more exceeding weight of glory than that from which so astonishing a providence had recalled her for a season. It was great for everybody but Dorcas. Tabitha, had you ever thought about that? There are a lot of people that we have their testimony that they had died and they'd gone to heaven and the Lord wanted to send them back and they didn't want to go and he insisted. The thing is, a lot of people have been there and come back that didn't want to come back. They liked it there just fine. We need to remember that when we lose a loved one. We need to remember this when it comes to our godly Christian mothers, because we know that they're in a great spot right now. Our other loved ones, we need to know that they're okay. I learned of a preacher recently whose son was killed in an automobile accident. He received a phone call to come down to the morgue and identify the body of his son. He said when he went into the room where they had laid his son, he saw the body on the table. He immediately knew it was his son. He said he broke down and cried and asked the Lord for a miracle to revive his son. But then there was a silence. And he said he heard his son's voice coming from behind his shoulder. And his son said, Dad, I don't want to come back. I don't want to come back. The minister said he knew then where his son was and the pain lifted. If there's one thing all of us as parents want, it's for our children to be in heaven with us. None of us wants to go there and not have our children there. Just kind of wrap things up. You've heard all that I've said, I know. In life as a Christian, I will encourage you, use the gifts you have where you are. When you find yourself in a tough spot, remember who's really in charge. Even though it may seem bad, you don't know what glory he may have to come out of that. And then finally, there are things more important than life. But we also need to remember we serve a God who is greater than life, a God who can raise the dead, a God who can cause mountains to move. In whatever dilemma, whatever difficulty you're facing in life, it's not too great for your God. Some people get to the place where they are just telling their God how big their mountains are. He's wanting to remind you this morning that your God is bigger than your mountains. Start telling your mountains how big your God is. And more than anything else, if you have loved ones who are spiritually dead, he can bring them to life. Pray for them. It may be their faith is so far gone that they can't even think about praying for themselves. But you can still pray for them. And God hears your prayers. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.